ऑडियो प्रॉब्लम डॉक्टर अजीत सर द टॉपिक ऑफ टुडे वेबिनार इज जेनेटिक पोटेंशियल ऑफ पैरासिटिक डिजीज ऑफ डॉग एंड कैट इज ग्रेटली कंसर्न्ड विद करंट सिनेरियो बिकॉज़ ग्रेजुअली डे बाय डे डॉग एंड कैट लवर आर इंक्रीजिंग ऑल ऑफ अस नो दैट many diseases especially parasitic diseases which have genetic importance have causes deadly health issue not only dog and cat even man especially children and women so in this context today webinar is an attempt to aware the participant and update the knowledge of genetic parasitic diseases of dog and cat sir so without taking much time i am going to invite respected director research sir for welcome address please sir uh, thank you very much uh, dr ajit uh, honorable vice chancellor dr rameshwar singh ji uh, speaker of the day uh, dr rajesh katoch uh, dr veer singh dean pg pg pgs uh, dr jk prashant dean bbc our faculty colleagues students and guest participants uh is uh, first of all i feel pleased to welcome you all to the today's seminar e seminar uh, on topic of genetic potential of parasitic diseases of dog and cat origin which is being organized under the banner of national agriculture higher education project which has been granted by the icr to bihar animal sciences university with a basic aim to for of human resource development in the university under this project we are uh, trying to sharpen the skills technical skills of our faculty and post graduate students and developing the different uh, infrastructure uh, to augment the capacity of our faculty as well as the students uh, well this topic uh, today's topic as we all uh, can see is a uh, of very wider importance and uh, first of all i'd like to at the onset i'll welcome our honorable vice chancellor rameshwar singh ji for joining this webinar and blessing us and uh, in fact he is the guiding force behind all such digital uh, workshops seminars we are organizing in this university and which all these recordings of all these seminars is being put on youtube channel of our university which can be visited by participants as and when required later at the later stages i'll also welcome our office senior officers dr veer singh dr jk prashad our faculty colleagues in good number they are participating our students and i can see some guest faculty from other institutes have also joined so i once again welcome them on behalf of basu family so without taking much of time uh, dr rajesh katoch is a good friend of uh, us uh, mine and uh, i think he felt very pleased as as soon as i invited him for this talk and uh, he suggested this uh, topic which uh, in fact uh, i also felt it is of great importance and uh, so we worked together with our coordinator dr ajit kumar who is uh, doing a great job for organizing this uh, seminar so once again welcome you all and without taking much of the time uh, dr ajit we can move ahead to this very interesting talk i expect is going to take place today of wider ramifications for especially for the persons involved in pet rearing uh, thank you thank you one and all thank you thank you sir then i would like to invite respected dean bbc dr jk prasad sir for your kind word about the webinar thank you dr ajit honorable vice chancellor dr rameshwar singh sir our learned speaker dr rajesh katosh dr research dear i come dean pgs all are my faculty members and students joined this very important webinar i welcome again 
everyone in this important webinar on genotic potential of parasitic diseases of dog and cat origin. As I was discussing just now that Dr. Katosh was my teacher when I was a student at Veterinary College Mathura. And really I feel proud privilege today to listen to him again. The topic of this webinar, as you know, that uh, related to this genotic potential of the parasites. And during this COVID period, this society has become aware about so many new terminology. No, we can't say new, but so many popular terminology like pandemic, social distancing, containment, zone, community spread, epidemic, fatality rate, or can say genotic, herd immunity, isolation, and so on. So many good words. So genotic is also one of them, very popular word nowadays. So certainly I can say that this very topic is well suitable during present era, present situation too. I strongly believe that everyone will enjoy this topic and certainly enjoy this talk also. So I welcome again Dr. Rajesh Katosh in this important webinar. So thank you very much. And again, over to Dr. Ajit, kindly proceed upon. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Now, in this contest, I would like to invite Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for opening remark. Under the guidance of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, all the academic activity of the university are going on without interruption during the COVID-19 pandemic situation. This is the great achievement for all of us. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ajit. At the outset, I extend a very hearty welcome and great appreciation for Professor Rajesh Katoj. Thank you, sir. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sir. <coughs> Good afternoon. It is a, a very welcome gesture by you to have spared your time and uh, having agreed to deliver this a special talk uh, today. It's and my pleasure, sir. Uh, interest of participants, the number is uh, steadily growing and uh, it shows the immense importance of this topic. We are having a series of uh, lectures and webinars and I'm happy that uh, we are able to take help uh, or rope in experts from different universities and uh, even across the international community. We are having uh, speakers from abroad as well as from India who are known for their uh, expertise and their standing in the field. And uh, this adds a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge and uh, yeah, helps in uh, creating awareness on different topics. And uh, uh, the students and uh, especially the young learners, they feel so motivated and uh, get involved. And some of them may you know, choose these areas to further specialization. And uh, some of the field veterinarians and others will be benefited by the kind of diagnostic methods and also the therapeutic uh, line of action. Uh, to be taken. So zoonosis, as Dr. Prashad was telling, uh, is a buzzword for today. And uh, we all, you know, have become epidemiologists and the society at large is being uh, made aware more and more about uh, the kind of uh, preventive medicine, herd immunity, etc., etc. We all know that uh, companion animals, you know, uh, stay very close to us and uh, we human beings you know spend a lot of time with them and uh, we get very intimately involved with our pets so uh, the number of zoonotic diseases which you know happen through different vectors or through these animals they become more chances of contacting them when we are having this kind of relationship almost like family member. So uh, this topic becomes more relevant to us 
and uh, I understand that Professor Rajesh Katoch, uh, being such a veteran and senior uh, faculty and resource person in this area, uh, he will be uh, dealing with this topic at length. And I hope uh, the audience, the participants will take very active interest and there will be good interaction uh, in the discussion on different issues wherever uh, students you want to have your some queries you can write in the chat box and participate in the proceedings so that it becomes a, not a mono dialogue but a two way dialogue and helps in uh, improving our experience of teaching and learning so without uh, staying in between you and dr katoch I once again uh, welcome Dr. Katoch on behalf of the fraternity of Bihar Animal Sciences University, all students, faculty and staff. We are also happy to welcome you, Dr. Katoch. Thank you, sir. And, uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dr. Katoch. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, sir, for your, your valuable words and blessings. Before I start the lecture, I want to introduce Today's speaker, respected Dr. Katoz sir, is presently working as Professor and Head, Department of Veterinary Parasitology, Faculty of Veterinary and Animal Science, as first Jambu, and also working as a Dean of Student Welfare, as first Jambu. Sir has vast experience in the field of veterinary parasitology. In this context, sir has published 170 research papers in national and international journal of review. He has guided seven PhD and eight MBSc student. He has handled 15 projects as sponsored by different agencies like DVT, DST, NAWAD, RKVY, ICAR, Indian Health, and Indian Neurological. He has recipient of many awards like IF, VP Fellow 2017, JP Dube Young Scientist Award, Nisamani Parija Award, work on genetic diseases, Smile Orenson Award, and sir has also written four books and 10 book chapter. This is the about today brief resume of today respected speaker. So without taking any much time, I would like to invite today a speaker, respected Rajesh, Dr. Rajesh Kato, sir, for important lecture. Sir, please. Yes, thank you. My screen is visible, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. Nice. Before I start my lecture, I thank Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, DRI, Director of Research, Akumar, and Coordinator. I thank everybody that you have given a chance to me to share my experience on genotic parasites. So today's topic, genotic potential of parasitic diseases of dog and cat origin. It has immense importance, you know, because with the upcoming of towns, nuclear families, people are keeping dog and cat as their pets, but they are not following the protocols which are to be followed. So they are, suffering with the diseases which are of parasitic origin. I'm, I'm talking only of parasitic origin. Remember that I'm not taking diseases of bacterial and viral uh, or fungal origin. So when we talk about these genotic diseases, parasitic genosis impact depends upon the species, which species we are talking about, whether it is roundworm, whether it is a protozoan parasite, and then the intensity of the infection, how much infective uh, uh, material the animal is transmitting and which human is getting. And the location of the parasite in human being is another important point. 
certain parasite, they are limited only up to the epidermis. Some goes into our vital organs. So if we see the epidemiology of parasitic zoonosis, both wild and domestic animals play a major role. Continuously produce infective stages and have a potential and which is pathogenic to man. The problem of zoonosis is constantly changing, dependent upon changing ecological pattern, man and animal and microbial parasitic population. Genotic diseases are increasingly linked to environmental change and human behavior. Disruption of forest, rapid urbanization and population growth is bringing people into closer contact with the animal species they may never have been before. Pressure on ecosystems, climate change and economic de development are the key factors. And this economic development leading to nuclear families and leading to practice or keep a pet. So that pet is causing, uh, bringing out certain infective stages, which are of a genotic potential. So how we can get these diseases from these pets? One, four or five ways we can get these diseases. One is direct contact. Direct contact means we are petting the animal or touching the animal. So egg attached to the body coat, we get it. It doesn't require any incubation period in the nature. That is for the Echinococcus granulosus egg I am talking about. Indirect contact. Indirect contact means where the animal has been kept and a person goes there and comes in touch with the floor where water is there. So he can get cutaneous lava migrants. Then third is vector bond. Leishmania and dirofilaria are the major example where a sand fly bites a dog, which is a reservoir for Leishmania, and then it infects the human being or vice versa is also there. So I'll be talking about genosis and reverse genosis or anthropogenosis in other words, we can talk about. Then food bond, you know, food bond, you know very well meat bond diseases. In meat bond, I have taken only the disease which comes from dog or cat and that I have taken only toxoplasmosis. That is a good example, undercooked meat, we can get a tissue cyst of toxoplasma. And the last water bond, water generally get contaminated with the cystic stages of giardia, cryptosporidium or eggs of worms. And when we take this contaminated water or water contaminated with these eggs or oocyst, we get the in infection. Even in the swimming pool, one can get infection of cryptosporidium. If we see, we'll go one by one. The first one is Echinococcus. It is the smallest tapeworm of the dog. You know, It has four species, Echinococcus granulosus, Multilocularis, Oligarthus, and Vogelii. First two are up of genotic importance, remember that. Echinococcus granulosus is found in every continent except Antarctica. And in human Echinococcus, five to 10% cases in certain areas has been reported. And in animal, the range is from five to 95% animals are infected for hydatosis. If you do these studies, you go to slaughterhouse, examine lung and liver of the animals, you will find this is Echinococcus multilocularis, alveolar hydatid disease. It is a metastatic type, you know, multilocularis. Luckily, we don't have. A few reports are there, but uh, Akit et al. 1972, one report is there from Chandigarh, that of the human who has visited outside of the country. So in from India, alveolar hydrated cyst, rare cases have been reported and they are not being confirmed. It is only confirmed to Northern hemisphere and around about 18,000 cases are reported every year. Out of that 91% cases are reported from China. Echinococcus oligarthus and Vogelii, luckily it is in the Central and South America and uh, we are far away from that place. And uh, only four cases have been reported, genotic due to Echinococcus oligarthus. So the most important for Indian contest is Echinococcus granulosus. It is the smallest tapeworm of the dog. Generally, uh, all the tapeworm pass gravid segments, but Echinococcus, the gravid segment is half the size of the total worm and it is ruptured in the intestine and teeny eggs are passed as shown in the diagram. In the below, there is a teeny egg I have shown. So this teeny egg is passed. This Teenid egg is just under the microscope, is just like a yellow dot, but when you see it in 10x, it, it will show cartwheel shape. And 
if you see its incidence i have taken recent uh, review i have done i have not taken old review so uh, in bhutan a uh, 3.2 stray dogs are positive for a kind of uh, for tini dex basra iraq 10% iran 10% samarkand 1.6% tanzania 73% african country have have infection they are endemic tunisia 8 to 41% certain provinces as 8% certain our uh, ranging between 8 to 41% but remember that 10% more than 10% dogs have shown tini dex in our sub uh, indian state indian country uh, from indian different states or towns amritsar jawalpur pandnagar shrinagar jammu chaudhary et al 1994 has reported more than 10% of the infection even in jammu it is more than 10% in palampur it is approximately 4% which work i had done there so infection what i have observed in the studies that infection is more in dogs around slaughter houses because generally in slaughter houses or in illegal slaughters the offals are thrown out if some cystic stage is there it is thrown out and the stray dog feeds on it so much more infection was found in the dogs which were around the fish markets or around meat markets as compared to pet and stray dogs of the urban area these eggs passed in the feces contaminate water resources and get attached to fruit and vegetables since we examine slaughter houses only small ruminants in jammu and uh, when i was in bareilly we examined buffalo slaughter house large number of hydrated cysts were observed in these animals in liver and lungs sometimes the fluid in one cyst used to be uh, just one bucket full 20 liters of fluid you can imagine the suffering this cyst is causing in the animals since we don't do post mortem from human beings i cannot say the exact but uh, as per literature the size is comparatively small so prevalence in rural area where carcass are disposed this is questionable because in rural area the livestock carcasses are thrown in particular designated area where it is taken or eaten by the stray dogs in this way they are disposed there is no proper way of disposing so infection in rural area is also quite high human can be infected with the eggs attached to the body coat if you are keeping a pet dog goes for defecation if it is positive for that kind of cocos cocos a kind of cocos then these a kind of cocos egg doesn't require any time of you know, for incubation hello i am audible yes sir. yes yes please go ahead okay. human can be infected with these eggs because they are attached to the body coat and these egg doesn't require incubation period even if you uh, touch a thermometer and take a temperature of the dog from anal region without gloves you can get this infection nobody teaches this in the clinics since it is very difficult to differentiate between the egg of echinococcus and different tinea species under the microscope if you see tinea egg think it is of echinococcus because the other tinea species in dog tinea ovis tinea crabi tinea hydatigena tinea cerealis uh, these all tinea different tinea their eggs and echinococcus eggs you cannot differentiate under microscope but on molecular basis you can identify you can differentiate them which is not possible in each every lab in the country so the simple life cycle i have just tried here dog eggs are passed in the feces these eggs remains attached to the anal regions subsequently attached to the body coat and hairs uh, if some kid is there in the house dog is sitting on the sofa his toffee falls falls down so in that way uh, veterinarians who are handling the dogs without gloves uh, they are also exposed to it even the owner of the dog is always in question so once the dog passes the feces the feces remains in the pasture or agriculture field these eggs with the rain water they are dis they disperse and they get attached to grass or vegetables fruits and waters so when we take this vegetables and fruits then we get these eggs through our uh, fruit and water whereas that our herbivore animals maybe cattle sheep goat get this infection and uh, these hydrated cysts once develop in them these are fed as offals to dog or uncooked 
meat when you give to dog, there is a chance dog gets the infection. Generally, what I have seen in the slaughterhouse, whenever there is, uh, there is a cyst in the liver, they rupture the cyst, all the protocols is attached to the meat, they remove the cystic zone, they remove the germinal membrane, which is full of protocols, and they throw it outside. And as such, that fluid which attached to the liver is uh, containing a lot of protocols. And if you are feeding raw meat to your pet, then he will get those protocols. And in that uh, pet, echinococcus will develop. So diagrammatic representation here, I have shown the dog passing these eggs, eggs going to the either to the herbivores or to the humans. And remember that echinococcus is not a problem of India. It is a problem of developed nations also. They also have to dispose the dog and cat feces. They have a set protocols. We don't have set protocols for disposing the dog or cat feces. That's why the infection will rise in a passage of time in this country as the number of pets will increase. And the stray dog population is increasing. As you know very well, there are two scavenging animals, either vultures, vultures or dogs. Vultures are reducing, so that is being compensated by increase in stray population of dogs. Human hydrolysis, that because genotysis is my main agenda, <clears throat> when we see more than 1 million people are affected with the echinococcus at one time. In endemic regions, human incidence rate for cystic echinococcus can reach more than 50 per 1 lakh persons per year, and prevalence level are as high as 5 to 10 percent in certain parts of Argentina, Peru, East Africa, Central Asia, and China. Remember that this data I have taken from WHO reports and CDC reports and FAO reports. From there, I have taken this data. Human infection with echinococcus granulosus leads to develop of one or more hydrated cysts located most often in liver and lungs. But if you go to the net and look for the human infection in your zone, you will get this infection. Very rarely they are found in bones, kidneys, spleen, muscles, and central nervous system. I have observed once one hydrated cyst in the ventricles of the buffalo in one of the postmortems. And this is endemic problem in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh in human beings. Remember that India is not uh, away from this infection. When we talk about this infection, once you take the egg today, you may, infest, uh, you may show or manifest the disease after 16, 30 years. Asymptomatic incubation period of the disease can last for years together. And only when it triggers clinical signs, when then we come to know that we are suffering with high ketosis. Or generally, during certain other operation, people learn that they are also suffering with high ketosis. Because when this cyst is increasing in size, pressure of this cyst is there, particularly in liver or in the lungs. Respiratory problem will be there, digestive problem will be there. So you will understand, you will go for the examination and you will get this, uh, that you are suffering with some cystic stage insight. Obstruction, because they call, cause obstruction to the digestive system or respiratory system, then also you will let you know that if you have temperature and bacterial infection, then hydrated cysts when get infected with bacteria, you get temperature and other complications. If when two animals, they fight, you know, uh, there is a rupture of hydrated cysts, it can result in anaphylactic shock. But in human being, even a small leakage can result in anaphylactic shock. Outcome of the disease depends upon number of cysts, how many number of cysts there, what is the size of the cyst, and location. That is important. Report, it has been reported from different towns of our country, Pondicherry, Himachal report is there, Chennai, Calcutta, Amritsar, Aligarh, Kan. Kan I have taken very few of them. There is large number of reports. Cysts develop in any site of the body. The predilection site is right lobe of the liver in human being, where 60% cases are observed followed by lungs, 40%. This I have data I have taken from Taplial, although this type of da similar data is available in WHO site also. Human hydrotrisis often associated with clinical sign, particularly when function of the infected organ is impaired. So with the, how it is diagnosed? Cassoni test was the old test which was available, which was on the based on the principle of immediate hypersensitivity reaction to hydrated fluid sensitivity. And it was sensitivity was 60 to 80 percent, and it gave false positive results also many a time. Then came antigen detection test, wherein ELISA, latest agglutination, counter immunoelectrophoresis was used in for detecting the antigen in urine and serum. 
but the best one is antibody detection test antibody detection test elisa latest aglut uh, antibody detection test latest agglutination test elisa using crude cyst fluid antigen when hydrated fluid is used as an antigen where in indirect fluorescent antibody test indirect hemagglutination test when we are using that hydrated cyst fluid antigen so that is important uh, there are two antigen one is r5 and one is uh, antigen b they are very important but confirmatory test is immunodiffusion or electroimmunodiffusion western blot shows 92% sensitivity and 100% specificity it is with done with antigen b which winds to igg4 patients with the liver cyst show better better results this antigen b is in abundant in the hydrated cyst fluid so then we go for the diagnosis imaging methods they play important role because they are non invasive methods and can detect non symptomatic cases and in zero negative individuals a case where we do not find any symptom and the case where ser serologically that has come negative but when we go for the imaging methods x rays ultrasound computer tomography you may find this cyst this cyst are found through x ray in liver and lungs ultrasound we can detect that there is single cyst or multiple cystic lesions computer tomography you can uh, 90 to 100% effective it is it is accurate and it also helps in de uh, detecting the complication that uh, with the cyst whether it is attached to which organ uh, what is the size number etc parija who is working in jipmer uh, parasitologist basically medical parasitologist he says that two to three tests generally should be preferred for accurate diagnosis and uh, i too agree and who also agree for that when we go for the treatment prazequantel is a drug of choice 5 mg per kg body weight is a drug of choice for dogs whereas albendazole and mebendazole is given in human beings or in the animals having the cystic stages and they are to be given a pretty long period and very heavy doses although human medicine we don't prescribe so the next important disease is visceral larva migrans in visceral larva migrans i left over the other two that is uh, echinococcus multilocularis because that is not prevalent in our country although it is in northern hemisphere and it is metastatic type of disease so it is uh, since it is not uh, reported from our country much so i have not taken much weight as to it so the second disease is visceral larva migrans visceral larva migrans a disease syndrome caused by migration of non human nematode larva remember that non human nematode larva if human nematode larva is there it will complete its life cycle and it affects 20 million people around the world human infection or ingestion of infective ascarid eggs of non human origin hatching in the intestine invading the mucosa and migrating to liver lungs and other visceral organs all of them first goes to liver and it is mainly with the toxocara canis and toxocara fallis both from the dog and cat toxocara are important in this case because this we find in majority of the pups will be positive for toxocara and these eggs the important point is the eggs which i am showing in the picture and the toxocara which is shown from the dog gut this egg is not infective with what i have shown in this picture in this egg l1 will develop inside it and l2 will develop once l2 develop then this egg becomes infective so after passage of time in the nature it become infective it is not directly infective like echinococcus egg so in humans they do not develop to adult but induce granulomatous lesion which cause local damage when we take a egg of dog or cat having infective stage that is l2 containing egg when we take it do not develop to adult in our body but it induces a granulomatous lesion whichever organ it may go so vlm is seen generally in the children below 5 years of age and uh, who are a habit of eating the dirt particularly in the parks when they take that dirt they take the infective stage so if we see the toxocara canis life cycle it's very interesting l2 eggs are passed x then l1 develops inside the egg l2 develops this l2 that red with the red mark i have shown direct ingestion of eggs by man through infected hands by kid dog handlers and by veterinarians it will go to its gut from there to liver 
mainly starting from the liver, then it will be distributed through all other organs, maybe lungs, maybe brain, whichever organ it wants to go with, uh, it can reach. Whereas the L2 containing eggs are distributed through rainwater. And if they are eaten by the dog above the age of four months, in that it will go to its gut, they will open and then they will migrate and settle in the muscles. They will not cause much damage to the adults or the dogs which are more than four months. And once these dogs, they settle in the muscles, whereas the dogs below four months of age, when they take these eggs, the eggs will go into their gut. From there, it will reach to liver, lungs, tracheal migration, we say. And from lungs, we cough up, it goes into the intestine of the dog and formation of adult parasite is there. However, in the adult animals, the male are dead end, but the females, when they get pregnant, these eggs, uh, these larva which are sitting in the muscles due to hormonal impact, they move through transmental roots to the liver of the uh, fetus. From there, it will go for a tracheal migration. Once it is born, it will go to tracheal migration and formation of adult will be there. However, in the initial transmammary route, these larva are passed, L3 will be passed, and these L3 are taken by the pups. So generally, you might have seen that pups, they die very soon uh, at the age of around about 10 days, because by that time, they have not taken anything from the outside. But still, when you do postmortem, you'll find large number of toxocaracanis in their gut, which is blocking their gut. So these pups are to be deformed at early age because they get the infection either through transplacental root or transmammary root. Remember that once the female is uh, infected and the larva settles in the muscles, it will give for many generations, it will infect the babies or pups inside them. So VLM clinical features depends upon the site, degree and duration. How many numbers the individual has taken? Fever is common, hepatomegaly, pneumonitis, globulin level will increase, weight loss will be there, constant coughing, pica are the major symptoms. Larva in the inner organs, especially in the liver, lungs, brains, and sometimes in the eye. Neurological disturbances are also seen. Blood examination generally show leukocytosis, eosinophilia, and high level of immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M. A presumptive diagnosis rests on clinical signs, history of exposure to puppies. ELISA has been reported to be highly specific and sensitive test. Laboratory findings, eosinophilia, leukocytosis, and antibodies to toxocara. Here I want to say one or two words because generally we don't examine uh, human samples. So we don't get the, but one must know if your kid is taking uh, dirt, he has every chance to get this infection. And when I have studied the epidemiology of this parasite in pups, generally we have two major uh, waves because two times pups are born in a year. So two times I have seen that when pups number increases in the area concern, the number of eggs in the soil also increases at that time. So we get two waves in a year because a lot of migration of these larva to pups occurs during this period. And these pups, they uh, transmit a lot of infection in the nature. If we see the seroprevalence in the human beings, it has been done. It has been found quite high. Nepal, Bali, and other countries have 50, more than 50%. Even USA, 14%, 88 to 94. In 2008, 5% has been, it has been reduced to 5% from 2000 to 2000, uh, 2011 to 2014. This data was calculated by Liu et al. in 2014. So recently CDC in 2010, they, uh, they have reported four to 23% children have been infected with toxocara infection. And the average age is eight years for the uh, children of USA. Colombia, 81% of uh, children are positive. Uh, Peru and Brazil, more than 40%. Four to 31 in developing countries. Increase in tropical zone, 86%. Nigeria, 86%. India also, the incidence is quite high. There are a few reports. Uh, one was from Srinagar, high incident, 30, more than 30% was there. So infection is quite high. Uh, zero prevalence is there. That means that kid has got that infection some part of their life, although they might not have shown a large symptom, might be one or two larva might have been there. Ocular larva migrants is typically caused by migration of this larva. 
many a times this goes to the eye also not in the other visceral organs once it goes to eyes we call it as ocular lava migrans and it damages the optic nerve and or it sometimes why the central nervous system it goes to that place retinal vessels it damages in ocular lava migrans lesions produced are generally misdiagnosed as retinoblastoma resulting in surgical enucleation so eye is lost in that case so it has to be differentially diagnosed from toxoplasma from retinoblastoma from other infections of the eyes ocular lava migrans occur in older children not in young children with rare eosinophilia in this case eosinophilia is not there visceral uh, otherwise other visceral organ you we find eosinophilia leukocytosis and in uh, <laughs> antibodies so one how to prevent visceral lava migrans or ocular lava migrans control the spread of dog cat feces regular treatment of pet to reduce worm burdens and limits the acts in the soil it's uh, this the process you know you might have seen in your neighbor people are taking their pets to public park playgrounds and sidewalks where they defecate and there is no proper way of disposing the dog feces remember that 50% puppies and 20% of older dogs are infected with toxoplasma species this is data from who so hand hygiene is also important once you are handling a pet thereafter you must wash your hand properly the next disease which i have taken is cutaneous lava migrans cutaneous lava migrans is caused by hookworms of dog and cat ankylostoma caninum resilences majority of these photographs are my collection of my work from palampur from uh, jammu so these this is from the cat which we have done work from in my lab in jammu uh, ankylostoma tubiformi anterior and posterior end these are the eggs for tubiformi and if it's life cycle of cutaneous lava migrans egg are passed in the feces l1 is released here the l1 is released in the nature it is not inside that so that l1 mold to l2 and then it mold to l3 l3 is very active and it is the infective stage so when the dog sits on its l3 the it actively penetrates into the dog and it goes into the blood and then go to tracheal migration and becomes adult in the intestine of it is if l3 goes with the water of food by dog it finally reach to blood tracheal migration and adult in the intestine and again this adult will start passing the eggs but if these l3 penetrates the human being then cutaneous lava migrans occurs in normal animal host larva are able to penetrate the deeper layer of skin by reaching their via circulation in human the larva is unable to prevent the basement membrane to invade the dermis so the disease remain connected to the outer layer of the skin the larva produce itching papule which develop in serpiginous tunnels in epidermis generally snake movement serpiginous tunnels are just like snake movement in epidermis lesions are clearly seen with naked visible eyes lesions shift 2 cm approximately per day and the movement of the larva thus called a creeping eruptions when they move it causes itching and discomfort and there will be a swelling and if once the individual have a habit of scratching it will scratch and lead the creeping infection with the bacterial infection so it he would be there lesions are more common on the back side because on sea beaches on sand people generally lie down on the back so they get the infection feet or the hands which you place on the mud or sand and on the buttocks which you are placed on the sand while you are sitting on the sand or the ground somewhere even in the canals even a one drop of water contain hundreds of larvae and this also ankylostoma caninum when i have done the epidemiology studies ankylostoma caninum is much prevalent in jammu in majority part of our country caninum is much prevalent brasiliensis is responsible for uh, this uh, clm in uh, assam area but caninum was much more prevalent in all over the other parts and this caninum the area where we can research can be done literature it is not available if l3 infective stage is orally goes to human being if orally taken by human being what will be the fate of l3 so we have done these studies on diabetic rats and on healthy rats we have fed these few of the larvae have gone to the brain or abdomen to liver lungs different location they have gone so that is a important aspect where research is needed if uh, hookworm larva orally they are taken by the human being what will be its fate so this is a picture i am showing 
Here the dogs are there. They have come for defecation. They are persons are walking barefooted. So this larva can, uh, shown on the picture, can penetrate easily into their feet and cause the infection. Observing high prevalence of hookworms in dogs suggests that prevalence of CLM may be much higher than actually been reported. Actually, it is a self-limiting, basically, this disease. So generally, if after five to six weeks, the larva dies off. So generally, people don't report it. However, global prevalence of hookworm is 18%. In India, approximately 200 million people are affected by hookworms. This is a reference of Aurora et al. 1976. And as I already have told you, resilience is a major cause of CLM in Assam. CLM left in, uh, limiting in nature, so not recorded, reported by many of the, uh, many of the sufferer. Preventive measures, regular deworming of dog and cats, prevent contamination of soil by dog and cat feces. At least the area where you are staying, you should not allow dog and cat feces in and around in your kitchen gardens. Proper and prompt disposal of dog and cat feces. We don't have any set protocol in our country to dispose dog and cat feces if somebody has kept pet. So these infections are going to come. Avoid barefoot walk in the parks because generally people say that it gives uh, too much of relaxation, BP will low down, nothing will happen. You can get the cutaneous lava migrants infection. Health education to public, particularly people who keep dogs and cat as pet is needed. Actually, parasitic diseases are neglected diseases because they are blackmailers. Parasites generally don't kill the host. They only lower the immunity and predispose the animal to wide area of uh, other diseases of biological origin, like bacteria and viruses. The third or fourth one, the host, they share the host. This parasite is found in dog also, and it is found in cat, fox also. So why it is important, that's why I have taken, because flea is the intermediate host. And that flea can infect human being also and dog also and cat also. So these are the uh, co uh, collections of dog, diplidium. This is a uh, mature segment is shown in the second picture and the third is egg is there. Diplidium canarium, gravid eggs are passed in the feces. These gravid eggs just appear like cucumber seed like and they are motile. They show movement. Eggs are eaten by the larval stages of flea. Remember that these eggs, these gravid segment Cucumber seed like when they move on the, you will never find these uh, segments in the feces. Or uh, they sometimes come even uh, from the anal region outside on their own by their movement. And they move few meters from the area of defecation. And while moving out, they pass the eggs. These eggs are eaten by the larval stages of flea. Remember that larval stages of the flea are coprophagus in habit. Fleas are blood suckers. But the larval stages of flea are coprophagus. They take these eggs when they feed on feces. And in these uh, uh, fleas, this egg convert into a next stage that is, we call it a cysticercoid, larval stage of the tapeworm. And this flea, which is having cysticercoid, or this lice, which is having cysticercoid, when accidentally taken by the man or by the dog, you, you have seen that dog, when it is beaten by the uh, flea, it immediately bites that area. So flea gets right into his mouth. And if somebody, small kid is sitting uh, by side of dog and flea is there, and if flea jumps to in, into his uh, plate, he will accidentally take that flea. So in that way, this once flea is taken inside the intestine, the flea's outer covering is dissolved and the cysticercoid develops into a tape worm. This tape worm's uh, length goes up to around about uh, 60 centimeter. And they will pass the gravid segment regularly. When they pass the gravid segment, these are the photos which I have taken from the cat. It is called a cat diplidium caninum, which I have taken in Jammu from a cat postmortem. So scolex and hooks are seen, mature segments are shown. So dog also, it is the same life cycle, eggs are passed. This is the larval stage and larval stage to flea and flea is accidentally ingested, as I have told you earlier. Worldwide, this tapeworm is common among pets, dogs and cats. Human infection is rare, but has been reported from every inhabited continent. In hills, it is quite common. In hills, diplodium infection is common in uh, human beings, in small kids. The most striking feature in animals and children consists of passage of gravid segments. 
these gravid segments can be found in perianal region in the feces on diapers or on floor coverings or on furniture they are motile and generally confused to be as maggots just like cucumber seed they appears to be size is equally same when freshly passed most infection with diplidium caninum are asymptomatic pet may exhibit behavior to relieve anal pruritus generally in animals dogs when this um, uh, gravid segment comes out from the anus it causes a irritation to the anus so dog sits in a sitting posture it drags its anus onto the ground so this has to be differentiated from anal pruritus or impacted anal glands remember that and you must have a history of fleas on the dog then this infection can can come to human beings also in your house the next important parasite i have taken is toxoplasma gondii toxoplasma gondii is important it is a important cat parasite in cat it is a protozoan parasite up till now we were talking about helmets now this is toxoplasma gondii it is a protozoan parasite it infects all warm blooded animal including human and causes the disease toxoplasmosis coccidian parasite it is a behavior is like just coccidian parasite toxon name it has derived from the shape of tex, uh, tachyzoid it has two three stages one is loose cyst tachyzoid and bradyzoid bradyzoid are tissue cyst mainly in muscles and brain tachyzoid in blood sexual form is loose cyst so this is the life cycle of the cat cat passes the egg this green arrow small one is the toxoplasma the other bigger one is the isospora so it take 1 to 5 days for sporulation and then once sporulated in 1 to 5 days it is taken by the rat or mouse in which tissue cyst in muscles and brain is developed and when this mouse is eaten up by black one black life cycle uh, with the black arrows then the cat get the infection from the rat that is a normal story of the life cycle but this sporulated loose cyst when accidentally taken by the human then human get infected or this sporulated loose cyst when taken up by the backyard poultry sheep goat any herbivore then these backyard poultry or the poultry or the sheep goat or any other animal cattle they will get this sporulated loose cyst it will develop into a tissue cyst in their muscles and in the tissue cyst will develop in their muscles and brain and when we consume this backyard poultry sheep and goat this uh, tissue cyst will come into our body orally when we uh, semi cooked or partially cooked meat when is taken it comes into our gut and from there we are getting infected human to human infection also exist one one human is infected his tachyzoids are present in blood if blood transfusion take place this uh, particular diagrams i have taken from uh, dr am malathi and this uh tachyzoid stage can also infect or organ transplantation is there then also we can get this infection but the important point is in human male is a dead end but when female male get the symptoms of toxoplasmosis when uh, his immunity goes down he suffer with the aids he suffer with the tuberculosis or some infection but female when she gets in pregnancy this toxocara immediately infects the fetus and that is important point it infects the fetus and cause damage to the fetus i will be dealing it with the congenital toxoplasmosis in the next slides so how we can get the infection toxoplasmosis in human we can get by eating food and water contaminated with cat feces wherein we are getting oose cyst sporulated oose cyst and eating undercooked meat we get the tissue cyst that is bradyzoid blood transfusion and organ transplantation we get tachyzoids as well as bradyzoid particularly in transplantation bradyzoid as well as tachyzoids transplacental mother to fetus it also move from mother to fetus transplacental move is there in pregnancy toxoplasma is present in every country and zero positivity range is less than 10% to over 90% remember that 25% of the world population is sub, uh, shows zero positivity to toxoplasmosis and uh, generally uh, there is one sentence that it helps in release in dopamine in the brain so all majority of the intelligent person in the world do are show zero positivity to toxoplasmosis congenital toxoplasmosis occurs in infants following maternal transmission it can result in fetal death remember that 
abortions and in syndromes that include neurological and neurocognitive deficits and chorioretinitis generally these symptoms are seen in later age of the fetus in humans uh, host the parasite form tissue cyst most commonly in the skeletal muscles myocardium brain and eyes these cysts may remain throughout the life of the host toxoplasmosis is considered to be the leading cause of the death attributed to food borne illness in united states more than 40 million men women and children in us carry the toxoplasma parasite but very few have symptoms because the immune system usually keeps the parasite from causing illness who estimates that every year there are over 1 million that is 10 lakh cases of toxoplasmosis in european region caused by contaminated food toxoplasmosis symptoms most healthy people who are infected with toxoplasmosis have no signs or no symptoms some people however develop signs and symptoms similar to those of flu including body aches swollen lymph nodes headache fever and fatigue but immunocompromised individuals the symptoms are severe headache will be there confusion will be there poor coordination will be there seizures will be there it will resemble like uh, tuberculosis pneumocystis will be opportunistic parasite although it is very common with the aids also blurred vision uh, severe inflammation of a retina ocular toxoplasmosis causes toxoplasmosis symptoms in babies is very important you know first time in the infection pregnancy if any individual uh, lady is uh, being infected with toxoplasma in her pregnancy without showing any symptom it can pass the infection to the fetus she may not show any symptom in during even during the pregnancy fetus is more prone to contract infection if mother is infected in the third trimester if third trimester of the infection the lady get infected with the toxoplasma she is sure shot going to transmit it to the animal but less chances if it she is infected in first trimester but on the other hand contrary if the lady is infected in the first trimester of the pregnancy it the serious there will be serious outcomes in the fetus many early infections end in stillbirth or miscarriage infants who survive are likely to be born with serious problems such as seizures and large livers and spleen yellowing of skins and whites of eyes small number of babies show sign at birth actually majority of the animals uh, uh, majority of the teenagers they show the hearing loss mental disability or serious eye infection hello toxoplasmosis prevention so how we can prevent wear gloves when you garden or handle soil don't eat raw or undercooked meat wash kitchen utensils thoroughly wash all fruits and vegetables thoroughly don't take unpasteurized milk cover children's sand boxes uh, wherever sand is there you know generally this dog cat all they go and sit there and they pass their feces and human kids also have a habit of playing at that place so chances of infections are more common diagnosis is important tachycytes in blood tissue cyst in biopsy we can go for gym sustaining silver and immunoparoxy stains serological tests are important uh, sabin feldman dye test gold standard antibody detection test in this test a uh, very few labs uh, are doing it because live tachycytes are being used in this test live tachycytes are incubated with the test serum and complement followed by addition to methylene blue and reincubation in positive cases antibodies bind to tachycytes and kill due to complement mediated lysis kill tachycytes are thin distorted and colorless these are very few labs are uh, doing this test igm alisa igg alisa and igm avidity test are also there being used diagnosis molecular diagnosis is there animal inoculation uh, diagnosis is there tissue culture diagnosis is there imaging methods are existing nowadays diagnosis of congenital toxoplasmosis that is important you know toxoplasmosis antigen is the amniotic fluid actually nowadays uh, it it is in the any pregnant woman when goes to the hospital she is uh, asked for toxoplasma test torch test they say t stand for the toxoplasma in that case toxoplasma is the first out of the all other uh, five six diseases they test for it igm antibodies if are found that means the infection is recent one and uh, igg it is a old infection pcr we can use ultrasound we can use 20 to 24 weeks of gestation so toxoplasmosis they say that there is a sea of toxoplasmosis in and around us every out of all the population if randomly examined 25% people come positive recent data was there on the icmr site 
they had done sampling for something approximately 1 lakh people and 25000 were positive although we don't uh, have a pet cat as a pet but these phthalates were which are in open the eggs are discharged oocyst comes they attach to various water resources uh, from water resources as well as from vegetation and uh, in on uh, there is data you know sheep ha sheep is very much zero positive even bacteria poultry is much zero positive for toxoplasma so that in that way it is important giardiosis is uh, giardia is common everybody knows amoeba and giardia you go to doctor gastroenteritis he will give you tz norflox he will give you dependol lam uh, nowadays oxin uh, ornidazole and uh, oxfendazole i think uh, this one antibiotic and one uh, anti uh, anti what do you say prozon this is combination they are giving it but if you see giardia there are six known species and only giardia diurnalis has been found to infect humans and mammals and there are eight assemblage a to h have been reported and a b can cause infection to humans and mammals while c to g infect animals but occasionally found in humans assemblage c and d are most commonly infect canids that is important assemblage c and d most commonly infects but dogs are predominantly infected with canid specific genotypes of g journalis our may also have a potential genotic assemblage that is a and b a1 a2 b3 and b4 that is important there the studies is are important their genosis is concerned actually there is a controversy you know whether it is transmitted from man to animal from dog to animal or we are infecting dogs uh, it is still in question prevalence developed world we find 7% infection of giardia and world uh, overall developing world we find 30% approximately 200 million people are infected worldwide giardia usually spreads when giardia cyst within the feces contaminate food and water and which are consumed orally symptoms are very common uh, one can find you know when you feel that uh, feel for diarrhea is there feel for fe uh, defecating is there and uh, abdominal pain is there and in feces is having something uh, fatty discharge bloating and flatulence is very common so when because it impairs the fat metabolism uh, giardiosis so it is very common when the stool sample if you see it, it will have a fat will be there because fat metabolism is disturbed most people are asymptomatic only one third shows the symptoms leishmaniosis this is another important protozoan parasite leishmania and it is important as bihar is concerned as i am talking to the majority who are from that state leishmania as you know was reported long back uh, by leishman and donovan i one was working there dum dum fever it was famous as a dum dum fever dum dum is the name of the airport of calcutta airport now it has been termed to subhashji neta Uh, netaji subhash chandra uh, airport international airport but earlier it was termed as dum dum and it was known as dum dum fever kalazar commonly known it is as visceral form kala javar it comes from the hindi word kala javar the human turns black and continuous is in the fever from that the word came kalazar and is the most serious form of the disease the cutaneous form where we find lesions on the cutaneous region in any part of the body and the third one is mucocutaneous which is not much prevalent in peru or brazil leishmania is transmitted by bite of infected female flevobotomus fly sand flies these sand flies have a character you know they have a beaded antenna and lancet shaped wing wing venation is parallel it is very common characters of the sand fly it is very easily seen wings are held roof like Gen generally when fly sits the uh, the wings they fold back but in case of sand flies they stand and as if they are uh, attached to a roof and wing venation is parallel where we do not find in others and beaded antenna is just like a necklace you know the disease affects some of the poorest people and malnutrition people poor housing weak immune system and lack of financial resources that is the economic concept uh, is concerned but deforestation building of dams irrigation schemes and urbanization as we are entering into the forest area this is present in the wild dogs wild animals from there it is being transmitted to 
by sand fly to the human beings from human beings to dogs or it is transmitting uh, close contact of wildlife with the dog it is transmitted to dog and dog transmitted to us dog actors there is a wire host and it is estimated that 7 lakh to 1 million cases occurs annually only small fraction of these are uh, cause uh, fraction infected by parasite cause leishmaniasis will eventually develop to disease generally it goes undiagnosed in many of the people who never reports it there are four species which causes cutaneous leishmaniasis leishmania tropica major atopica mexicana brasiliensis mucocutaneous we are concerned with the visceral leishmaniasis donovani infantum chagasai we are concerned with tropica which causes cutaneous form in india if we see the life cycle i have taken this diagram from the web uh, where leishmania is shown that wildlife a reservoir is there in phantom then a human it is giving infection to human human are giving to the dogs so as i was saying as you will enter more of the development more entry into the forest you will get new type of diseases visceral leishmaniasis is also known as kalazar is fatal if left untreated in over 95% of uh, cases it is characterized by irregular bouts of fever weight loss enlargement of spleen liver as i have told you uh, kalazar the man turns black and black uh, and anemia is there and uh, fever will not be he will be continuously in fever most cases occur in brazil east africa and in india recently 50000 to 90000 new cases of bl occur worldwide annually with only 25 to 45% reported to who it is one of the top parasitic diseases with the outbreak and mortality potential mortality is there in this case in 2019 more than 90% of new cases were reported to who occurred in 10 countries where india also stands visceral larva migrans is a genetic disease involving different canine species especially dogs generally not only dogs there are 70 species have been reported to act as reservoir so dog is one because we have a good amount of dog strip population it is famous as delhi boil name Biganer boil, Delhi boil. There are different names are there for cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis. Visceral leishmaniasis, stereotypical manifestations. I have already taken. So the lesions typically evolve from papules to nodular plaques to ulcerative lesions with raised borders. Central, it is depressed and covered by a scab crust. Some lesion persists as nodules. The lesions usually are painless but can be painful. If ulcerative lesions become infected with bacteria, or if lesions are near joint, the healing process typically results in atrophic scarring. Means I mean to say, these lesions, when they goes off, it causes a scar on your face. The slides which I have taken from Dr. T. V. Rao presentation on the web, diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis is shown in the lady's face, and the other one is lupus. Some small loop is developing there. and this is the actual cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis slides which i have taken from dr t v rao slide presentation presently available on the web it is like this you can see the lesions so these lesions will leave a scar permanent scar on the body mucocutaneous is the third which leads to partial or total destruction of mucous membranes of the nose mouth and throat over 90% of mucocutaneous leishmaniasis cases occurs in bolivia brazil ethiopia and peru so we don't have this much problem but in this case the loss is much more damage is more and when we go for diagnosis visceral we have to take bone marrow splenic aspirate lymph node or tissue biopsies we can go under microscope or we can culture them in triple and media serological direct agglutination test complement fixation test immunofluorescent antibody test indirect heme agglutination test varying sensitivity and specificity they have shown direct agglutination test using trypsin size promestigot is useful in endemic zone with where it has shown its sensitivity of 91 to 100% sensitivity and 71% to 100% specificity cutaneous gymsa stain for ld body leishmania donovani bodies is done biopsy microscope for ld bodies or culture in triple and media promestigots and ld bodies can be detected in buffy coat of the blood you know buffy coat of the blood where white cells are there you can look into those white blood cells you will find ld bodies in bone marrow aspirates and lymph node aspirate you can see this uh, leishmania donovani bodies with that i end and i come to the conclusion dog and cat bond parasitic diseases can be prevented
although I have left two diseases, one is diarophilaria and one is diphalobothrium. In diphalobothrium, we share uh, one of the host. We are also definitive host and dog is also definitive host and cat is also definitive host for diphalobothrium. Diarophilaria amitis, uh, in India, very few reports are there. Now, I have incurred, encountered one uh, heartworm recently in Jammu in one of the postmortems. It was approximately 30 centimeter in the left ventricle. And uh, although I have not taken it, I have taken only the major, which are common one, dog and cat born parasitic diseases can be prevented. Six out of the seven human helminthic infection could be prevented if humans could be isolated from their own waste products. The seventh being preventable by isolating humans from insects and snail vectors. This great parasitologist Stahl has stated in 1946, my conclusion is that if dog and cats are to be kept, there must be a strict protocol. There must be a protocol for disposal of their feces. They must be registered with the municipalities. Stray population, difficult to control, but if we cannot kill them as per the PETA rules, we must deworm them. Once they are dewormed, the infection chances of passing of these infected stages will be reduced. And there must be some license fees because these are contaminating the environment and will lead to, in a passage of time, there will be a severe outbreak because these all diseases are neglected disease. Neither human uh, doctors are working much on them, nor the veterinarians are, veterinarians are also not working on them. So majority of these diseases are the area, which is, uh, I can say, vacant area, where you can do a lot of research. And because these larval stages are very common and you can easily see under microscope. In just, you collect the grass, just wash it in a water bucket, take the underneath portion, decant the upper portion, you will find all these eggs in that. So these eggs are available on the pasture. A lot of studies are being done on that. And any vegetable which is grown on the area in and around uh, of the drainage, there you will find all these eggs attached to the vegetables human to human and animal to human. Remember that. That is important. And being a veterinarian, you can identify animal eggs very easily and human eggs also very easily in stool samples. So that is very easy for a human, uh, for a veterinarian to identify. So uh, the concept of one health is important that I can say, and thank you for patient hearing me or bearing with me. Thank you. Any questions? Now Talk is open. Now the questions and yeah, question, question you, you can, can, you can you ask can, directly. Yeah, directly. You make it open. I'm ready to answer for everybody. Sir, cutaneous uh, sir, larva. All, yeah. Yeah. Sir, first of all, uh, very, very good afternoon. Myself, Vivek Agrazer. Yeah. And it is my pleasure to hear your elaborative and very nice informative lecture, sir. And uh, thank you. Sir, sir, my concern is that he, uh, for example, echinococcosis or uh, visceral larva migraines, yeah. the number of the eggs or the larvae are excreted through the feces in the yeah. so many. So yeah. if one or two cases are uh, found in that particular area, yeah. so there is a more chance that uh, other person will also get such type of infection. It might mean to say, suppose that in particular area, one or two person are found in, uh, positive, then that area should be screened. Because well, actually, yeah, I got your question. Actually, uh, Vivek, uh, Dr. Vivek, yes, actually, sir, yes, sir. Uh, in particularly in echinococcus, no, gravid eggs are, uh, gravid segments are not passed. Only eggs are passed. Okay. These teeny eggs gives you confusion. You can't uh, differentiate whether it is echinococcus egg or other teeny eggs. You're getting my point. When you uh, examine the dog, you will get teeny eggs. You do not know whether it is echinococcus egg or it is other teeny eggs. Because eggs are same. They come under the order teenidia. Family tinidae, genera tinea and echinococcus. So eggs are tinid eggs, commonly we call them. So it is very difficult because majority times dogs are positive for one or other tinea. Maybe tinea ovis, maybe tinea cerealis, any of the tinea. Okay, tinea pisiformis, tinea crebi, yes. or echinococcus granulosis, which is common within. Uh, it's very simple, you know. If you collect a hydrotheist from a cattle slaughterhouse or a buffalo slaughterhouse and you feed to a dog, uh, 
Right. Or you just open those cysts, collect that fluid, protocolysis, and feed to that dog. Within 48 days, the dog will show uh, passing the skinny rates. You're getting my point? Yes, sir. So yes. life cycle is very common. And every third, fourth buffalo is positive in Bareilly Slaughterhouse what, when I was studying my master's. And uh, here also in uh, Slaughterhouse, in small ruminants, we have uh, the flocks which are having sheep as well as uh, we are having dogs. Every sheep flock in hills have three or four dogs which uh, protects the uh, flock from wild animals. So the life cycle is completed there only because uh, uh, dog feces, eggs are attached, they are taken up by the sheep, sheep hydratases develop, offals are thrown by once this sheep die or uh, when they slaughter it, they open the offals, they throw it out, dog takes that and uh, worms develop in them. So your question is that if one case is observed, should we go for that? Uh, should we examine? My question is that if you have a pet, then you must deworm it or go for fecal examination every three months. Three months, one must go for fecal examination. If teenage eggs are found, immediately go for deworming and avoid. How we can avoid? That is very simple, you know. Don't give raw meat to your dog. Don't allow to, uh, what do you say? eat any of the wild uh, rat or mice or something like that where hydratases can be there or any other active I means it, it should be kept isolated in the house only it should not get exposure to raw meat under any circumstances so then he won't get the infection dog won't get the infection then we don't have the chance of getting the infection suppose if we get he, he get a raw offals of fish he will have every chance that he can get a diphalobotrin if he has a raw uh, if fleas are there Accidental flea ingestion in nurse will lead to diploidium caninum. So it depends how uh, efficiently you keep your pet. It should, because your pet is going to get infection from the raw meat. Thank you, sir. Okay. Another, another question asked, has asked by Dr. Saroj. Sir, what are the physiochemical mechanism behind the some species or, or a strain of any parasite or only have genetic importance rather than all. Physiochemical mechanism. Yes, yes sir. sir. Actually, it, it depends, you know. Uh, when you are, uh, all will not get the infection in the same way. Every biological system behaves in different way. Once the eggs come into the nature, suppose uh, I, I'll take the example of echinococcus. If eggs are coming into the nature, they can survive in the nature uh, for a pretty long period. Even some reports are there more than one year. But high temperature areas, these eggs are destroyed. So certain chemicals, if we, if we want to spray and kill them, so it is teenage, it is very difficult. We cannot even uh, kill these uh, larval stages. Remember that you try this, even ascarid eggs kept in 10% formalin, L1 continues to develop in them. Formalin does not enter to the body coat of teenage, uh, this egg, what do you say, ascarid egg. It goes on development. So physiochemical methods, I think uh, very difficult. Uh, dog pieces, if uh, it is properly disposed and exposed to certain uh, these uh, what is sodium hypochlorite, what they are using, they are, uh, what do you say, making pit, adding the pieces into that in uh, developed nation, there is a proper disposable method and high temperature will help in killing them. Thank you, sir. Another Any? question from Dr. Sriyas. He has asking the profile Prophylaxis treatment for tinnidia infection. What tinnidia? Sir, infection tinnidia. in dogs. Uh, he's asking for hydratosis in uh, herbivores, or he's asking for uh, tinnidia, tinnidia well, in dogs. He has asked for tinnia species, sir. Tinnia only mentioned tinnia species. Tinnia in dog, we can go for uh, this year. Uh, what is a prasequential? 5 to 15 milligram per kg. 15 milligram, it works for diphalobotrim also. 5 to 15, we can go for it. There is a lot of uh, work has been done, you know, in genotic parasites and dogs. A uh, lot of uh, work has been done. Recently, uh, I have gone through uh, from Gatnes up, one paper was there. But I have taken only few of them. I have not taken all of them. Hello, sir. May I speak? Yeah. So my name is Dr. Anil Kumar. I was yeah. diagnosed with neurosis of course way back in 2000. Okay, sir. 
So, so, so I was so much uh, so, so surprised how I got the infection because I was strictly uh, a vegetarian, not eating meat or anything, and uh, neither were the human doctors able to diagnose it. I'm just sharing some information. Yeah. So how I got it, I found it out by myself. Yeah, I the, can tell. The cats, they defecate in a soft soil. Okay. And I use gardening as a hobby. And so when I used to prepare my gardening mixture using okay. sand and other things, okay. the cat used to come and defecate. Okay. And at that time, I was smoking. So usually when I used gardening and taking the soil with my hands, I was also okay. smoking at the same time. And most probably I might have ingested some of the eggs. Okay. So they went to my brain. And okay. uh, when the fits came, I had a seizure. During okay. my work, and uh, well, the human doctors were not able to diagnose it properly. And one doctor from Neemans, Dr. Gilwas, who was a senior person, okay. was able to diagnose. And uh, then I went on treatment for around 15 days. Uh, at that time, only there was no MRI scan available okay. locally. Then it was done. Uh, then they found out a switch around one centimeter uh, long and big on my left occipital lobe. Yeah. And now they were able to destroy the cyst, but then the calcium deposits of the damn, damn thing remain there. Sorry for the language. It, uh -huh. No, no, I can understand. Actually, no. Uh, but, if, uh -huh. but if it was detected as neurocystic sarcosis, no? Sir. You are saying? Yes, sir. Neurocystic sarcosis, actually, their man and the pig is involved, basically. So that's all. And, that's uh, I, yeah, now you are asking how you got the infection, you are a vegetarian. That yes, question sir. is there. So yeah. for that answer is there, see, the normal life cycle is that ma man is the definitive host for tinea yeah. solium. It passes the gravid segments and yeah. these eggs comes out and pig, see, pig, they take the human feces and they get cystic stages in their muscles. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is a normal life cycle. What happens yeah. when a human who is suffering with the tinea solium passes eight to uh, 10 or 10 to 12 segments per day, gravid segment. And each segment is having 40,000 eggs. Suppose 10 segments are passed, means four like eggs are passed in the human pieces. And okay. if it is not, uh, if that pieces is not taken care by the dog, uh, pig, pig ne wo feces nahi khaya. Okay? okay, you got mm -hmm. it. Now yeah. that feces is having four like eggs. Those four like eggs with the rainwater, they get attached to the vegetables. Yes. Remember that our forefathers never used to eat uh, off season vegetables. Right. Oh, kabhi, they never used to say uh, green leafy vegetables in rainy seasons. Okay. They never knew what was the reason. B basically, right. the reason was that in rainy season, the, these eggs, they come and attach to the vegetables. Okay. And once we take these vegetables raw, we get the infection. Yes, sir, that, that's, the, that, that's the thing I, I ought to thought because I did my... Yeah. So in, you... Uh, at Gujarat. Where yeah. So you got that... In, you are saying you are a vegetarian, no? Uh, yeah. Commonly, uh, Commonly, this is termed as pork work. And many questions I get from this area also in Jammu Kashmir um, because uh, the other community do not take uh, pork. They say, well, how we can get a pork worm? I told you are not getting pork worm because the, uh, man has defecated somewhere else. That feces egg attached to various vegetables. Major source is uh, cabbage, they say, yes. because that is eaten raw in fast food. Yes. That's why you get chances of more of the infection, but it can yeah, attach yeah. to even radish also, carrot also, anything where it is a junction of greeny and uh, carrot is there, their uh, rainy season eggs, the vegetable, uh, they come and attach to those places. When we take anything raw, salad in public places, hmm. we take the egg of tinea solium. And when, or a person who is himself suffering with the tinea solium, when he takes his own eggs with his own hand, have multiple cysts. But when you get from vegetables, you get single egg. Generally, you get single cyst development in the brain. Oh, yeah. But when a person who is already suffering with the tinea solium regularly take a large number of eggs with his own hands, suffer with multiple cysts in his brain. It happens like that. Okay. Now, that was one, one doubt which I had because we, as a veterinarian, I uh, used to usually do a tapeworm. We used to go for 400, 400, 400 mg albendazole every three months. Regularly, yeah. what we used to take it, uh, but uh, the treatment they did for that was even uh, they gave me albendazole at the rate of I think uh, around 15 milligrams per day for around seven days continuously. I dose okay. it was given and uh, then it subsided. subsided. Okay. Now only the calcium deposit it's still there. The calcium deposits are still there, okay. and uh, they act at, at times they cause seizures to me. I'm retired now. 
Okay. But still, the last year was in Randhat. So, 19, I am changing my medicines. Okay. Now, under, right now, I am under global exam. Okay. So it's okay. happening. So I just want to share two things. One was that uh, in like the same same yeah. thing principles, we people yeah. use for irrigation, they use human waste water. Yeah. From Nalas and all those places. Yeah, yeah. There and you get the chances of this. So so Neurosystems. So we should not eat. Uh, so all my zoonotic classes which I take. Yeah. And field veterinarian, I call classes. I tell them not to eat raw vegetables. Keep yeah. washed. They need it. Second, even off season. Even off season. Second so there's only chance. Yes, sir. Second part is it's that really everybody is sitting in parks, there is a two grasses. Yeah. And the mirozoid to get the sunlight comes at and tips system not the tip of the grass. And they almost 90% of the people sitting in the garden or a park are yeah. so they tend to chew some grass. Yeah. They also ingest in the same way. Same way, yeah. Yes, sir. That's another thing I want to tell the people. So the veterinarians should be very careful in the sense that we all are susceptible to a lot of diseases. Many of us, we are very careful out in Kerala here. I am from Kerala, basically. Okay. Uh, but uh, the problem is that many of us, we have contact, uh, you and I am positive leptospira also. Okay. Uh, we are just we are handling dogs. Means now okay. we are not exposed to urination. Don't make it the same way. This cutaneous larval migrants you are talking about in human beings as well as in dogs. Yeah. So first, we are removed by hand. Okay. Just a very... Yeah. Kind of thing which could be removed, taken out with a piece of forceps or just by raw and pulling it out. So, is it could that be a dangerous thing to do? Because we advise the owner not to do it yeah. because he pulled it out and brought it to us. So, yeah. could it be dangerous for him? Should he get his uh, say stool or something examined in a regular manner? Or yeah, one one must put on gloves. You know, whenever you go for anything. This was done by the owner. The owner took it out and they took us right yeah. now. It's uh, quarantine and all those things. So he took it out and took a photograph, yeah. uh, a video. Or either I sent it to us, and then on seeing that, we were, so we, we advised him not to take it like that. That's how it's going on. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank Anil. Now I'll take the Shamala Deep. You have asked me a question why male dogs are attacked as dead end host, whereas through female transplanted transmission fetus occurs. It is nature, you know. The parasite wants to behave. If dog immunity goes down, it will suffer with the disease, but it doesn't transmit infection further. Remember that every life on this earth wants to keep its genetic material onto the ground. Remember that. Uh, as you know, there are certain ways male, and there are certain mating is there where male goes dead in arthropods, but still it mates. Male, one male is sufficient for one ram is sufficient for 50 females. So males, they are only for diversity in the nature. So once you want to perpetuate a life cycle, so you it is better to be in female. So in female transplantal, the transmission of parasite is easy and parasite always want to be there in the nature. You know, one egg of fasciola gives how many radia, how many saccharia, it is mere multiplication in number of the infective stages. So one, starting with the infection, large number of infective stages are created because they want to remain in the nature. As you know, uh, toxoplasma, positive rat, uh, rat or mice challenges the cat. Why? That parasite dictates. Parasite dictates the intermediate host to challenge it. So once the rat is eaten up by the cat, the parasite completes its life cycle. So parasites are very intelligent blackmailers in the body. They dictate terms to the individuals. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, my uh, question is, sir, if cutaneous larva migraines or Anji. visceral larva migraines, Visceral larva migraines will be visceral organ in the visceral organ, so we will know some signs that we can do in the test. If there is a cutaneous larva migraines, then we will be in the field condition. If there is a cutaneous larva migraines, then we can see it in the front of us. Yes, it is seen in front of us. I was in the net, I was actually presenting the other presentations of Toxoplasma. Yes, sir. And I mentioned it. There is very nice photographs on the net of cutaneous lava migrants, which are clearly visible because it does not go to the lower level. So on the upper layer only it is existing. So it is clearly visible lesions. And within five and six weeks, uh, they are self-limiting, you know. 
even uh, that's why they are not reported much cutaneous lava migrans although its infection should be big one because uh, what i have seen that uh, in uh, dog you cannot remove ankylostoma you give treatment over every 3 months the dog will become positive uh, because they, if you read its life cycle it is very interesting you know so, some of the larva comes mature into the gut some remains in the sum mucosa in larval stages once they are cured out another layer comes out so it comes in waves and once infected it is very difficult to remove uh, hookworms at least from the dogs every time when i examine the dog they are positive for hookworms majority of the times even if you give dewormer after another two or three months they will be again positive so life cycle is very simple in this case and uh, hookworm generally seen on the feet or the hand or the back and they are clearly visible lesion you can see on the net very good photographs are there from the medical science group and in this case you, in this case you won't find much of eosinophilia eosinophilia is also not there as in case of visceral larva migrans it is there thank you sir thank you any other question sir sir dr vijendra mohanty sir sir has asked please suggest some chemical which paid clinician can use to sanitize their hand to ensure full protection against all zoonotic contaminate from pets actually my opinion is that there is no nothing like that onium sodium hypochlorite you can use but still for ascaridex i won't think it will work it can work in high concentration which will be damaging the hand it is only uh, one must use gloves while working with the dog stool samples and cat stool samples my so i don't uh, recommend any chemicals much of the chemicals sodium hypochlorite is being used but it is not of much of use thank you sir thank you any another question any participant if no question thank you sir for your informative in, interesting and interactive lecture hope this will be helpful for all of us to prevent the zoonotic diseases of parasite transmitted from dog and cats now thank you thank you sir now i am going to invite renowned veterinary parasitologist and presently working as dri company pgs pgs respected dr b singh sir he has also written a book on today topic of zoonotic parasitic diseases so i am in requesting to our dri company pgs sir for his special remark thank you dr ajit thank you sir thank you boss uh, honorable vice chancellor dr ramesh singh sir my fellow colleagues professor rajesh katoch hod as well as dean student welfare at sarkast jammu director research basu dr ramendra kumar ji dean dr jk prasad dean bvc and senior most parasitologist dr ml gatne professor ml gatne is joined from bombay then dr hirani then dr vivek agarwal then dr saima many parasitologists they have also joined and uh, my faculty members dear students today's talk is very very informative i can say it is a awareness creating talk although we are taking very light zoonotic diseases which are transmitted between man and animal animal to man man to animal so we should take precaution and we are keeping the pet but we if we are not maintaining proper hygiene and not proper precautions then chances of diseases as dr rajesh narrated so generally two groups of parasite one is protozoa another is helmin in protozoa he told toxoplasmosis lismaniosis and giardiasis and in helminthic group uh, echinococcosis toxocariasis etc visceral larva migrants etc these are very very important which they are causing or they are damaging to our visceral organs although these are small things we are not taking very light the ova or cyst they are in soil and they are contaminating 
either hand or then food water and they are getting inside the body and they are causing damage to the various visceral organs whether it is lung whether it is liver whether it is brain so this is a very very important talk and how to know we, being a veterinarian we should know the epidemiology life cycle how they are transmitting transmissions pathogenicity prevention identification of knowledge gap preventing of zoonotic disease infection is required and integrated multidisciplinary one health approach involving collaboration between veterinary medical scientist policy makers and public of health workers so yeah. this is a very important to prevent the disease once the prevent then there are no problem but for, for prevention we should create awareness then education and education is vaccine this way we can avoid these diseases so proper hand washing is a great reduce to risk this disease as in this in corona we are following hand washing so this way we can reduce but some of the parasites they are transmitted by through vectors so that should be also taken in mind and these are the diseases which are hidden form of the diseases and they may occur at any time any stage of the life so one should take be very careful for those who are maintaining the pets especially and even those who are not maintaining pets even the people are keeping dog and cats and they they are passing the excreta on the road side and ground and other things students or players they are playing games then they get infection because this ova this is they remain many months in the scent right. so to avoid all these things we should create awareness thank you professor kadosh you have delivered very nice talk it is thank you boss informative uh, very knowledgeable for us thank you boss thank you sir thank you sir for your valuable words thank now you. in the last session of webinar i would like to thank honorable vice chancellor sir for your gracious presence then i would like to thank today speaker respected dr rajesh kato sir for making aware and enlightened all of us about zoonotic parasitic diseases of dog and cat i am thanking to director research basu dr director ravind kumar sir for giving opportunity me to organize this webinar under the support of nhp icr new delhi i would like to thank respected dri company pgs dr veer singh sir for your gracious present i would like to thank our respected dean sir dr jk prasad sir for your gracious present and kind support sir under your guidance college activity clinical services and webinar organization are going on smoothly during this lockdown period last but not least i am very much thankful to all part participants especially parasitologist all over all over the india for their presence in the seminar dr getney sir dr banerjee sir dr irani sir for their gracious presence now thank you all of us thank you thank you thank you, thank you dr kapoor thank, 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 thank you sir thank you namaskar to all namaskar namaskar thank you